guys. We've got two friends standing here today, and I start off with friends because they really are friends. Uh, and they're going to give their uh, various perspectives on, and reasons on why Uncle John obviously is a Christian, and Mr. Kuvadia is going to speak on why he is a Muslim. Uh, Mr. Kuvadia has been involved with uh, outreach and ministry and Dawah for years. How many years? Oh, years. Ten, ten years. Ten years. And he's a practicing advocate in uh, Indonesia. And Uncle John is, uh, used to be, I don't know, I mean, I'm still, an still an attorney, uh, practicing, so they will be very articulate. You'll hear uh, they can uh, govern a conversation pretty well. But it's important to notice that these two are friends. They do have differences. Uh, and it's also an example to see how people, even if they disagree, uh, can speak and, uh, and talk with each other. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to afford 25 minutes to Uncle John. He's going to give the reasons for him being a Christian in 25 minutes. I'll time them. When you hear a noise coming from here, it is your time's up. But I'll, I'll give you a heads up. For, oh, watch the clock. You'll watch the clock. Okay. Uh, I'll give you a heads up uh, if you have no, three minutes left. So you just know. You, but I know you'll notice time. I know you also been on time. Uh, so then we're going to give Mark Kavaria uh, 25 minutes to present his case. Then we're going to give them each 10 minutes just to critique each other's presentation and maybe to ask questions or maybe ask clarifications. Uh, we'll do that in John first as well, and then Mr. Kuladia, two minutes as well. After that, we're going to ask you to ask questions to both of them, uh, even though I feel the questions might predominantly be for you today. <laughs> but anyway, uh, no, but anyway, please uh, feel free to ask a question. Please, when you ask a question, remember a question is that which has a question mark, question mark <laughs> after it. Uh, please make sure that you don't rumble. Please don't give us a long eulogy. Ask a question. Okay, so uh, we know exactly how to answer where they need to go with the conversation. Uh, if you want clarification on anything, if you want to ask anything about Islam, uh, obviously it will relate to the topic because uh, Muhammad here today is presenting Islam, you're welcome to do so. Uh, okay, so I'm going to stop and uh, I will start the clock as soon as you start to speak. I'm going to you for 25 minutes. Go for it. Right, uh, Muhammad, really good to see you again. Always a privilege to share a platform with you. Okay, why am I a Christian and not a Jew or a Muslim or anything else? And the answer to that is not because I was born into an Anglican home and I've grown up as a Christian and so on. I'm a Christian by independent conviction and I believe in the gospel and that is where I am. Not just, it's not just a religion with me like it is with many of you, it's not as well. It's something that, I, that grips me, and I believe it's the truth. And when it comes to asking yourself, why am I a Christian? Especially, why am I not a Muslim or a Jew? Well, I look back into religious history, and what I see is that throughout the world, belief in one supreme being, the monotheistic God, has steadily taken over so much of the world. For centuries, only the Jewish people generally believed in that. Other people like the Greeks as well sort of formulated the idea of one supreme being, but they had no idea who he might be. But the Jewish people knew because God was sending his prophets to them again and again, Moses, David, Solomon, you know the Muslim names, same with Islam, the Quran records this as well. It states that uh, we gave the prophethood and we gave the scripture to, to Ishaq, to Isaac, the line of Isaac, so that <clears throat> when it comes to monotheism, if you're going to ask who is the God of the universe, I think between us, we certainly can say, well, you've got to look into that heritage because we share it. Jews, Christians, and Muslims all share the same prophetic heritage. We all believe that God created Adam and Eve. We all believe in the, in the fact that the law was given to Moses. We, we, we acknowledge the prophets of old. The Quran itself, time and again, tells us that, you know, we say to them, we acknowledge the prophets, we believe in the prophets, we, and so on. The intention was always, at the time of when Islam began, to acknowledge the same God. So I look at it and I say, well, where do we go from there? How do I know where the truth is if it's somewhere in that line of, of, of that heritage? And what I find is, like it is even today generally with the world's knowledge of Muhammad or the world's knowledge of Confucius or uh, Moses or any other religious figure, generally there's not much a dispute about who they believe themselves to be or what their record is. The, the difficulty comes when we get to Jesus. 
Jesus is the one that resulted in the division of religious thinking across Islam, Christianity, and Judaism. And, it's, and even he today still results in a lot of division with so many other people coming from so many angles trying to tell us who the historical Jesus might have been and this and that. And you wonder why it is that we couldn't settle on Jesus and just say, who really was he? But to me, because that's where the division is, the Jewish people said, no, nope. Uh, they even accused him in the time of being a demon-possessed Samaritan. Uh, Muslim people say, yes, we acknowledge him, believe in him as a prophet of God, a messenger of God, but he was not the son of God, and so on. And then, of course, the Christian world says, oh, no, no, you know, we, we know who he was, our ancestors followed him, he is God incarnate, second person of the triune God. So I say to myself, find the truth about Jesus, and you'll find the truth about God. <laughs> That's where it is. I'm not going to go into why we divide on this, I'm going to go into one theme and one subject that, to me, like many others, just convinces me of the truth of a Christian faith. It's simply this. When I look at the time of Jesus and I look at the Jewish people, there was a fervent expectation. It was just literally ripping, rippling through the whole community of a coming Messiah, the one the Jews called Hamashiach, as we would say today, or Messiah, as, as it is in Hebrew. That's what they were looking for. They were looking and for and they were expecting by then somebody who was going to be very different to all the prophets who'd gone before him. The reason being that when that personality was promised, uh, God said, I won't quote verses here, I'm just going to be giving you a testimony here. God said to David through the prophet Nathan, I will raise up your offspring after you and I will establish his throne forever and his throne will in, I will establish his kingdom forever and his throne will endure forever. I will be his father and he will be my son. And it was from that promise that the Jewish people came to believe in a coming anointed one. And they called him Hamashiach. That was their title for him. Today, we agree, Christian, Muslim, Jew, all agree that whoever that promised Messiah was, and not the Jews so much, but, but we agree, Christ, Christians and Muslims, that it was Jesus. Because in our scripture, you read Ho Christos, that's the Greek expression, the Messiah, Jewish Hamashiach, and then in the Quran, Al Masih, the Messiah, Jesus. So when I look at this and I say to myself, but why were the Jewish people expecting somebody who was going to supersede Abraham, David, uh, every single one of the prophets who, and kings who went before him? Why did they believe that he was going to be a warrior king who was going to establish the nation of Israel as the greatest nation on earth. He was going to tramp all the other uh, nations underfoot and he was going to establish the throne of God forever and, and he would put all his enemies under his feet. And that's what they believed. And believe me, that goes a long way beyond what anybody else ever expected. So when I look at this and I say, well, even the Quran calls him al Masihu Isa. And if I look at Islam and I look at the Quran, because of that interest in Jesus, that's one of my first questions. What does that title mean? The Messiah, Jesus. And in the Quran, you'll find that Jesus is given that title 11 times. But no other prophet is given a title like that. In Islam today, in some ways, every prophet's got a title. Jesus is actually Ruhullah. In Islam, that is the spirit of Allah. Muhammad is Rasulullah, the prophet of Islam. And then you've got others like Kalima or Kalimullah, uh, Moses, Khalifa Tullah, the successor, David, and so on. They've all got names, but not in the Quran. In the Quran, only Jesus gets a title, al Masihu Isa. And no other prophet, not even Muhammad, the prophet of Islam, is given a title. So I ask myself, well, what does that title mean? The Quran makes no attempt to explain it, doesn't comment on it, it just awards it to Jesus. But to me, it must have some heavy implications because with the Jewish people, they knew hey, this Messiah is going to be somebody very special. It's going to be way above every other prophet. Even if you read the Psalms of Solomon, uh, these are apocryphal literature in the intertestamental period. Oh Lord, raise up to us our King, our Messiah. And that was the fervent expectation of the day. If they looked at Jesus and they said, if you are the Messiah, tell us plainly, and so on. Jesus declined 
to deliberately call himself the Messiah, even though the Quran and the New Testament freely acknowledge that he was. But he did that for a reason. And this is what I discover when I look carefully at this, that he would not take to himself that title as the Jews understood it. Uh, today, uh, I read in Bart Ehrman's writings and others that Jesus was not the Messiah the Jews were expecting. Fair enough. I freely admit that. But the question is, and this is how I see it, it's not that you know, Jesus got it wrong or the early Christians got it wrong. As E.P. Sanders says, the Christians invented some sort of Messiah. And Ehrman and others say that you know, Jesus of Nazareth doesn't fit the Messianic prophecy at all. So I look at that and I say to myself, well, then where are we? You know, well, if he is confirmed to be in Christianity and Islam, the Messiah, what sort of a Messiah was he? And something Jesus said gives me the answer. Jesus said, thus it is written that the Messiah should suffer, should first suffer before he enters into his glory. And I've spoken to you folk early in the week about this, but I'll cover it quickly again. First suffering means that he comes into the world the first time to suffer. Now, why would that be? Why would the Messiah do that? The promise to David had no inclusion of that at all. Just the, the, when the Messiah comes, he's coming in glory. But Jesus said, no, no, he suffers first, then he comes in glory. And when I look back, and I've spoken to you before on this, but today it's clearer than ever to me. This is the reason why I believe in Jesus as my Messiah. Two reasons, because I need a saviour, that's the one. I'll finish with that, I deliberately need one. And secondly, I can't save myself. And secondly, because I'm quite satisfied that Jesus was the Messiah, as he put it across. When you look in Old Testament times, you see that God promised two sons to the top patriarchs of Israel, not just one. God said to Abraham, I will give you a son by your wife Sarah and all the nations of the world will be blessed through him. Now, the Apostle Paul points out in Epistle to the Galatians, he says that in the original Hebrew, the word is in the singular, the Christ, the Messiah. It's not to the nation. It's not as though the nation would be a blessing to the Gentiles. It is one individual, your offspring, your immediate offspring, your son, will be the one who will bring the blessing of God upon all the nations of the world. And then to David, God says something very similar. I will give you a son, and I will raise up your offspring after you, singular again, and he will establish a kingdom, and his throne will endure forever. And that's exactly what Jesus is saying. First time coming to suffer, second time for glory. And when I look at the promise made to Abraham, and I look at Isaac, I can see a shadow, a clear shadow of Jesus, because as Isaac was born uniquely. He had, uh, his parents had had no children. Abraham was about 100 years old. Sarah was 90. They never had children, and she's now past the age of childbearing. But the son Isaac was born. Now, that's a unique birth, but nothing more. And even John the Baptist has a very similar unique birth. I won't go into it now, but it backs up what I'm saying, that, that Jesus came into the first time not as the Davidic Messiah, he came as the Abrahamic Messiah. And so at the time of Abraham, you see Isaac born uniquely, but when Jesus comes into the world, he's born supernaturally, born of a virgin woman. It's a reality. It's not a shadow. Same with Isaac. Uh, Through you all the nations of the world will be blessed, God says. But at a very young age, before he can have any children, God says to Abraham, sacrifice your son. To Ishmael, when it was Ishmael 14, when he was about 14 years of age, God said, reject him. But when it comes to Isaac, the real son of the promise, God says, sacrifice him. And for Abraham, that was difficult. How is he going to fulfill his promise that my son's going to be the blessing to all the nations of the world? In the end, Abraham believed that God, as it says in Hebrews, that God would raise Jesus from the dead. So he, he figuratively got him back. And Isaac wasn't offered at the last minute. God said, substitute him. And a ram in the thicket in the thorns, which reminds me of Jesus in the thicket with a crown of thorns on his head, is sacrificed instead. But again, you see the shadow. Isaac, to be the son who is sacrificed, but he isn't. It's only a shadow. Uh, Isaac, 
coming back from the dead, but only figuratively speaking, it's a shadow. And then becoming the blessing to all the nations of the world. And I, Abraham must have looked at him and could see that whoever this promised Messiah, the Abrahamic Messiah is, going to be born uniquely, going to be offered up as a sacrifice before he has anything to show for himself, but he will be raised from the dead. And because he conquers sin through a burnt offering, he'll become a blessing to all the nations of the world. And do we think that Abraham was just looking at Isaac? No, we told. The scripture tells you. That when Isaac says, what are we going to sacrifice? Abraham says to him, my son, God will give of himself the lamb for the offering. And then it's exactly the same when you look at John's gospel. Uh, Jesus said in John 8, 56, um, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. He saw it and was glad. Not David, Abraham. And this is where he rejoiced in it. He knew that God's saviour for the world was coming. A greater son of Abraham was coming. And what the Jews got wrong was that they only considered the promise made to David and they forgot the one made to Abraham. So all they were looking for was the Davidic Messiah. When Jesus said to them, um, what do you think of the Christ? Whose son is he? Straight away, son of David, unanimously. And that they got wrong. Correct answer to that would have been son of Abraham first, then the son of David. Son of Abraham in coming in humility and willing to be humiliated, but thereafter to be given up and then to come back in glory, as the scriptures teach us. And that is the only Messiah that I can see in the scripture. That was the promised Messiah to the people of Israel. It was their error in failing to see what Jesus meant when he said, oh, the Messiah comes first to suffer and then enter into his glory. Now the question comes, why should, and this is the acid question, I think with Muslims, Jews, all of us in the world, why should anyone suffer for us? Why? Why can we not find our own way with God? Why, why can not the God of the universe accept us as we are? As the Quran says, Allah forgives whom he wills. He doesn't need somebody to atone for anything. But I'm just going to give you a personal testimony because we're asking here, why am I a Christian? So we're speaking personally. Well, the main reason why I'm a Christian and I wouldn't be anything else is because I need a deliverer. I know that. I know myself. I'm 72 years of age today, as you know. It's my birthday. I don't want to go. I can't go back into the younger years and start my life all over again. And I know who the God of glory is. I've read the scriptures enough to see who he is. And I can't match up to him under any circumstances. My sins hold me down. And I know that. And that's why many years ago when I read Matthew's Gospel for the first time, seriously, I was going to read the whole New Testament just as an academic exercise, just to know what it taught way back in 1969. Now, once I got into reading it, I had to close it at the end of Matthew's Gospel. I was just shattered. I could see the first half of Matthew's Gospel, Jesus projecting the absolute righteousness of God and in himself, that he himself is the image of it, and then in the second half of it, showing how the holy human race splits into two camps, those who are heading for glory and those who are heading for destruction. As Jesus said at the end in Matthew 25, um, the righteous go away to eternal life, but the wicked to eternal destruction. And I could see that clearly. And by the end of that book, I just knew. I didn't hear any voices, but it came to me. Now you know who I am. Now you know the truth about me. Either turn and become a disciple of my son Jesus or walk away. But if you walk away, know that you stand condemned. And for three years, I couldn't turn. I had no power, no desire. For three years, I knew I stood condemned. I remember one night in 1971, I was being asked from my church, and I was not a committed Christian then. I wouldn't have invited myself to speak on anything. But the church thought well of me. I was in a server and everything. And so they sent me over with two other folk to, over the road to the Presbyterian church to represent the church and get involved with the young people in Benoni. But I didn't want to go. I was The night I left, I thought, why am I doing this? Why, am I, why did I ever agree to this? I don't want to get involved in this. I don't, the last thing I want to do is get involved in any kind of Christian thing. I don't have a feeling for it. And then as I drove down the road, something in me said, yes, but you know, if you're doing something for God. And at my young age then, about 19, I sort of thought comfortable about that. Well, you're actually doing something that might make him pleased with you. 
But in a moment it came over me and something just made me know. If this is what you're doing, if for once you are doing something for God, what about all the times when you've done everything against Him? What about your whole life? You're not living in relationship to Him at all. And as I turned into that church, I remember the conviction coming over me. You're not even coming here tonight with a good spirit. You don't want to be here. You're regretting ever agreeing to it. And it just came across me. You've never done anything of value as unto God in your whole life. You are totally condemned. And I knew I had to be redeemed. And the redeeming power of God came on me three, about a year and a half later, April the 2nd, 1972, when I became a born-again Christian. And since then, I live off that power. I live off that grace. I can't save myself. I'm going to close this talk just with a little story I cooked up that the only way I can describe myself in this situation. I sort of picture God sitting on one side of eternity and Satan and all his demons on the other. And God says to Satan, have you considered my servant John Gilchrist? I'm looking forward to spending eternity with him and, and in love to him and in fellowship with him. I'm looking forward to it. And I imagine the reaction from below. What? You don't know this guy. We know him. <laughs> you know this? We've been keeping track of him since he was a child. From the very day of his birth, we've been noting his sins. Look here, even 1948 to 49, he wasn't even a year old. We've still got a whole catalog of sins there. And if you go on and on, we've built up this whole library here. Look at these thick books. He <laughs> says to one of them, hey, be careful, don't drop it, it's heavy. You know, it's, it's full of it. It's full of all the sins he's committed. We've been, we've been monitoring him for decades. And we've got enough evidence, unlike Trump, we've got enough evidence to shut him out forever. So God looks at them and says, well, he says, I must tell you, I don't have all that. I've only got one book. And he holds the book up. And he says, let's have a look. I'll look in the index. So he looks in the index and says, there we are, John Gilchrist, 48, 11, 20, 5, 1, 2, 1, 0, 8, 6. Yeah, that's him. So, all right, that's his ID number, everything. Right, talking about the same person. So the Lord looks at them and he says, you know what? I've got his name. And there are two columns, one on the left, one on the right. And he says, on this column on the left is headed, good deeds that John Gilchrist has done that have earned him a place in the kingdom of heaven. And God says, there's nothing here, not one, not a word. He has never done anything good enough to earn a place among the angels and in the presence of God himself in heaven. So, but then there's another column here and it says, Sins that John has committed that will drive him out of heaven forever. And God says, there's nothing there. You've got volumes of it. I've got nothing. He puts a pick up and he says, hang on a minute, there was something written here. Looks carefully, he says, yeah. He says, a whole lot has been written here. I agree. A huge number of things were once written here. But somebody's blood came across this page and washed it away. And the Lord says, every single sin recorded in those books of yours was accounted for by my son. And then the Lord says to them, this book is called the Lamb's Book of Life. The important thing for John Gilchrist is his name's written in it. Nothing else matters. That's why I'm a Christian today. Because I don't believe that I'm capable of commending myself to God sufficiently that I can be saved in any other way. I'm not reflecting on Islam, Judaism, formal Christianity, nothing. That's missing for me. And the reason I believe in Jesus and I live for him and die for him in the end is because he's my hope. And I see a day coming, one day when the Lord raises us up to glory and then transforms us into the image of Jesus as he said he will. And I see the Lord saying to Satan, have a look at my son Jesus and have a look at John Gilchrist now. Spot the difference. Dead silence, can't find any. And then the Lord will say, see, I told you. I'm looking forward to spending eternity with him. My son redeemed him. And my attitude towards him is one of grace, love, and favor forever. That's why I'm a Christian today and nothing else. A few minutes left. A few minutes left, right. Three. <laughs> or I don't really know what to add to that, but I'll go back to Jesus being the Messiah quickly. Um, just to say this to you. Uh, when I talk about the Abrahamic Messiah, and I've given lectures on this, 
People always look at me as if to say, but you know, we've never seen that. This is something new. And I've said, well, all the apostles of God, or the, all the, uh, sorry, the disciples of Jesus who wrote the Gospels knew this. John the Apostle looked at Jesus, and if he had thought that Jesus was coming as the Davidic Messiah, he would have pointed to him. He said, I've come, for this I was called, and for this I've come forth, that I might reveal him to Israel. That's in John 1. So he's come to reveal the Messiah. He knows that, John. But which Messiah? If it had been the Davidic Messiah that, they, uh, that had been promised to David, he would have said, Behold the Lion of God who takes away the offense of Israel, who puts all its enemies under her feet, who conquers the nations of the world, and so on. Because that's what the Jews were expecting. When Bart Ehrman says Jesus wasn't the Messiah the Jews were expecting, he was quite right. That's what they were expecting. But John pointed to Jesus and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the whole world, Abrahamic Messiah. And then secondly, even Matthew. If you read Matthew's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 1, the very first verse in the New Testament, this is how he defines Jesus. Nowhere else in his Gospel does he define him. He says, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Now, get that word Christ, that means Messiah, title number one. Book of the genealogy of Jesus Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Why does he call him the son of Abraham as well as the son of David? Because Matthew knew he comes the first time to fulfill the promise of, uh, to God that the Gentiles would become the people of God. Matthew's gospel is full of that. The kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to other people <coughs> who, who, are, who deserve it. And he said to him, not only that, he said, but people will come from east and west and sit at table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, but you'll be cast out. And then finally, the last word in, John, in Matthew's gospel, as the first word is son of David, son of Abraham, the last word is go into all the world and make disciples of all nations, Abrahamic Messiah. Go to the world. Now that I've died and have risen again, my salvation is available to the whole world. Thank you, people. Thank you, uh, John. Lovely presentation. I appreciate it. I got to thank uh, Levin the Word for inviting me this morning. It's a pleasure to be with you. You seem to be a great audience. Nobody's killed me yet, so it's a great start. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I understand that you guys get, have got at least about a year of Bible studies underneath your belt. I think that's about right, right? So maybe we can start off with just by a show of hands, one or two questions to see what type of audience I'm dealing with, just from a Christian perspective. Um, I'd like to start off by asking, just, no, don't answer, just lift your hand up. If you know how many books there are in the New Testament? <laughs> okay, so we got about half of the people, all right, so I, I got an understanding. Anybody know, wants to venture out and uh, what's Paul's surname? Paul, the writer of three quarters of the New Testament. Any idea about the surname? <laughs> all right, okay. And then um, the last one. And I asked Donald yesterday, and he's a pastor, and he seemed to be a bit confused, so maybe I'll get some better answers. I asked, the last book of the New Testament is called the Book of Revelations. So is it those of you that say it's Revelations with an S, lift your hand up. And those that say it's Revelation without the S, you can keep your hand down, just so that I know. What's the name of the last book of the New Testament? Is it Revelations? Lift your hand up. So it's Revelation. That's excellent. Okay, and no, I'm dealing with an educated group of people. <laughs> so I can start off on a different level. But thank you once again. I'd like to start off with uh, Luke 24, 36. Shalom alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. This is what Jesus used to introduce himself when he introduced himself to his disciples, when he spoke to people. This was the greeting. I think it's more important and more virtuous to say, peace be upon you, meaning that may the peace, blessings, and mercy of God Almighty be on all of you. To say good morning has a limited type of effect. You know, the morning is good, yeah, so be it. But I think when you add a prayer into that, that may the peace, mercy of God Almighty be on you, it seems to have uh, added divine experience to that. But let, let's make the question, and something that I need to be discussing today is why am I not a Christian? So I need to give you a dynamism of Islam, and maybe to bring in something from Christianity from a personal perspective. So I'm not here to preach today. I may go to certain vice, uh, words from the Quran, and or verses from the Quran and from the Bible, but more particularly just from a subjective point of view, so you understand who I am and generally how mu Muslims would view Muslim, Islam and Christianity as the two different theologies. 
Um, in doing that, I'd like to start off also by praising God Almighty, knowing that He's the creator, the nourisher, the sustainer, and without God Almighty, would not be here. There's a verse in the Quran that says, It's a very powerful verse, and what it means is, just think about your existence. There was a time where you were not even existing. There was a time when your name was not even mentioned in the universe. You were nothing. You were not even an atom or an iota of anything. But God took you out from complete nothingness and He created who you are today. Not only has He given us life. Remember that God could have created us into a dog or a mosquito or a fly. But He chose from all of His creations to make us human beings. He made us the best of his creations, so much so today that we have the faculty of thinking, the ability to communicate and to think, and that's why we become eternally grateful to God. And even if we have to spend our whole life thanking God, we understand that that's still not enough. I think Christians agree with me when I generally say that, that all your actions in the world and all your works are of little value if you have little faith. So it's together with your faith, but we believe as much as you can do in terms of your ability and your capacity. So from a Muslim perspective, Islam guides us from the time that we are conceived. You know, when, when, when you are conceived in your mother's womb, God starts to take care of you. Because in that time that you are, being con con you have, you are conceived and your, the womb is developing and you are developing as a, as a young embryo, your mother can't control what happens within her. This is where God comes in. And it's through that whole process of nine months where he nourishes you, where he forms you, where he sustains you so that you, you come out to be a perfect human being. And even in that birthing process, we recognize that something as big as a little watermelon, for example, has to come through something as small as this. And the whole, whole event is something which we would say it's an impossibility becoming possible. It's only through the miracle and the intervention of God that human life actually is created. And we recognize this as Muslims. We know that every step of our, way, of, of our journey through life, that God has always been there with us. When you just came out of your mother's womb, you're a young infant, a couple of minutes old, your mother takes her to her breast. And naturally, there's a natural inclination that God has taught us how to feed. So naturally, the baby starts understanding without even the mental capacity rather he then naturally inclines towards the breastfeeding and even in a cold day the coldest of days the mother's breast milk is warm and nourishing and palatable to the child and even on a hot day the milk is nourishing and cool and palatable to the child this is the process of life that we look at things from a perspective and in every step of our way islam is there as a partner with us to show us and to to to, to guide us about the perspective of life. And as we go through our life, Islam is such a thing that I'd say it's a complete way of life in the sense that we don't have the permissibility to go outside the realm. So some people would argue that Islam is very rigid and Islam is very strict. But it's this type of structure, it's this type of behavioral code that allows us to develop religiously. Why? Because you in a university environment or in a college environment, even in a high school, you have certain rules and regulations associated with your teaching. If you want to qualify, if you want to attend the school, you can't smoke, you've got to wear a uniform, you've got to be there between uh, this time and this time. So there's a structure. Why? Because it's there to improve you. And for us as Muslims, we do have a, we have a moral code. We have a very strong structural system. We've got to pray five times. Firstly, I mean, the most important thing is we've got to believe in one God. And maybe Islam and Christianity say, shares that particular view. In the wide spectrum of things, we could say we're the closest in that we recognize the prophets of each other as being great men. We believe in the oneness of God completely. And this is absolute monotheism to the extent that even the, the Trinity will not exist in the Quran, from the Quranic perspective. And we, sure, we're not, we, we're not exactly the same. Others will be following the, exactly the same religion. But to us, the most important thing is believing in the oneness of God. And while John was talking about this discussion that he, that he could very well be having in front of God, it brought to me a particular, something, something a, a previous story came into my head. And this is a narration by the Prophet Muhammad. So the Prophet Muhammad, for those of you who don't know, is the final prophet of God, having come from a long series of prophets, starting from the earlier prophets, that's, where Adam was a prophet and not a prophet, but nonetheless the major prophets, 
being Noah, David, Moses, Abraham, were all prophets of Islam as well. So Prophet Muhammad was the final, God, uh, final prophet of God, and he's standing in front of God, and he narrates, narrates to us the story, and he says, all your actions are placed on a scale. And on one side of the scale, you've got 99 scrolls of bad deeds. 99 scrolls of bad deeds. That's, it's not just 99 bad deeds, 99 scrolls of bad deeds, meaning really books of bad deeds on one side of the scale. And this person puts his head down and he thinks to himself, absolute despondency, and he thinks to himself, there's no way I'm going to be able to get out of this 99 scrolls of bad deeds. And then like, he sees the card coming down and floating and landing on the other side of the scale. And the other side of the scale is written, there is none worthy of worship besides Allah. That's all that's written on the, on the card. Because once in his life, throughout his years of sin, once in his life he said, Shama Israelu Adonai Ilaheinu Adonai Ikhad. Yo, children of Israel, the Lord our God is one God. Very same thing in Arabic. There is none worthy of worship besides God Almighty. We do not make Buddha, Krishna, Jesus Christ, any of the previous, any of the creation, we don't make them to be gods. And it is just that one saying that outweighed 99 years, 99 scrolls of bad deeds, because the name of God was said with sincere repentance, with, with some level of sincerity, and that would outweigh 99, year, 99 scrolls of bad deeds. So for us, our lifestyle and our changes all form within the ambit of monotheism. Whenever we do something, we need to consider God first. So we, we may ritualize, people say we ritualize our religion by praying five times a day. But this is what keeps, what keeps us grounded. This is what keeps us firm. So our first prayer is before sunrise, very early. In today's day and age, it's like 4.30. And it finishes off the last prayer after sunset, after complete darkness is set in, which is around 8 o'clock. But five times a day is what we believe is the absolute minimum that we need to do for the thankfulness that we wish to, to show back to God. For the grace that he has shown back to us, we'd like to be thankful for that. So when you ask a Muslim about his prayers, it may appear to be difficult. But believe you me, it's some sort of a love showing. It's a love offering that we show to God to thank him for having created us, for giving us good guidance, for giving us... God will continue to give us even if we don't worship him. We know that. People who don't worship God continue to get from God every day till the day they die. In fact, those people that worship God less get more. <laughs> That's the reality. The people who are God-fearing and God-conscious, but it's not about the wealth. We don't believe that God loves you. By God loving you, it's a display of your wealth. It doesn't necessarily mean when Jesus came into Jerusalem, he came on a donkey. It's... Out of the four Gospels, I think that's the only thing you can say that is standard across all the four Gospels, is that Jesus came into Jerusalem on a donkey. What, what does that mean? It means that Jesus was a humble person, that the material wealth of this world did not entertain him. The donkey is like a Honda Ballad of today, the old Honda Ballads with no doors in, or beetle or something, you know. But the reality is that it wasn't, he could have come in on a camel, he could have come in on a stallion, he could have, he could have come in on anything else. But we know and understand that God gave to some of the prophets, like David and Solomon, and God made some of the other prophets go through a lot of perseverance. Even the issue of the Last Supper, this was a gift that God had given to Jesus Christ. They ate, and they ate well, but it was a sign that this is not how they ate every day. For those of you that want to take an interest about the story of the Last Supper, there's actually the story in the Quran called the Table Spread, Al-Ma'idah. And the story is contained there, but I'm not, I don't have the time to go into the theological aspects today. I think more importantly, we just want to have this comparative discussion. It's not even a debate, so please don't see it as a debate. So I think if we go back to the original topic, why am I not a Christian? I want to put things into perspective. Remember that I need to be asking myself the question, and you'd be asking yourself the same question, what's the purpose of life? That really is the main reason that we have been created. We have not been created for merriment and joy, for fun making, for toying around and amassing wealth. That's really not the purpose. None of the scriptures actually say that's a sign of good fortune and that's a sign of success in this world and the year after. We ask ourselves the question, and from a Quranic perspective, the Quran says, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ I'm quoting in Arabic, so if people, there's, there's authenticity, so I don't give the whole text, the quotation, the verse and number, but 
people understand it when they hear it. Uh, Allah, God tells us in the Quran that we have created you to worship God. It's unequivocal that we, we have been created for, on this, for the purpose of worshiping God. Now, I understand that from the Quran because I read it and it's, 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 it's plain as day. You don't need somebody to interpret, reinterpret those verses for you. And when I look at things from a Christian perspective and I wonder to myself, let me see what the Bible has to offer in terms of the purpose of life. When I ask certain uh, friends of mine, or when I do a bit of homework and I speak to Christians, I get different responses about what's the purpose of life. I get told that Adam and Eve were created in the Garden of Bliss, be it the Garden of Eden, and we as human beings will always strive to get back to that. So the purpose is getting back to that original system. Fine. Other people who tell me our purpose in love, in life, for life, is to love and obey God. That's fine. I mean, that's his interpretation. Other people will say, go forth and multiply. Go and acquire wealth and, and seek the world. And that's your, that's your position. And, and I'm not turning this into a bait. I'm, I'm trying to show you the variances that are contained within Christianity so that when I look at things, I say, but there is no immediate answer. So it's a varied convoluted system of responses that I'm going to be getting. I get the response, go forth and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them. So in other words, the, the, the belief of everybody else around you is as important as your belief system, and you should try to spread that, so that's, that's, that's the purpose of your existence today. So for me, looking at things, I'm, I'm thinking to myself, I'm not getting that direct response from the Bible that I'm getting from the Quran. You know, when I see when the Quran says, worship me, it means worship me to the extent that know and recognize who God is in your life. At the same time, when you conduct your affairs with your neighbors, with your employees, with your friends, with your employers, conduct them in a way that you're always mindful of who God is in your life. You know, so yeah, definitely, you know, looking, looking at things from, from, from the big questions, we would get these types of uh, concerns coming out from a Muslim's perspective. Is Christianity really giving and setting the moral example about the purpose of life? Another thing that, uh, uh, that concerns me from the Christian perspective is that the Old Testament especially has no references or very little references to the afterlife. Is there a heaven? Is there a, a hell? How do we deal with these issues? So I'm forced to look at some of the Christian or some of the New Testament writings regarding the afterlife. And then also I seem to be getting different understandings from the biblical writers and the analysts there. Right. For example, I'll get that, um, going back to the, the, the Old Testament, I, there's a verse that, that particularly sticks out, and that's Ezekiel 18, 19, that says, the soul that sinneth shall die. The father shall not bear the iniquities of the son, neither shall the son bear the iniquities of the father. This death, the soul that sinners shall die, is again interpreted and reinterpreted to say that it means eternal damnation, or it could mean a death where there is no life after the second death. After the judgment, there's a death. I'm not here to argue what I'm saying is there appears to be some sort of contradictions within the interpretations but the simple examination of the word that says, for those people that sin, those people that distance themselves from God, there is no salvation for them. Right? And then, you know, that contradicts with Hebrews, where it says that man will only be disappointed for man to die only once. So whether you die once or you die twice is particular versions. Then you have different interpretations of life after death, and that would include being in the company of God. So for some people, there's... Uh, the, the, the relationship that you will have with God after judgment. And for other people, they tell you, no, it's heaven on earth to the extent that earth will be recreated and everybody will continue to relive their life on earth. Then you get other versions that talk about uh, human beings turning into angels. What I'm saying is the consistency about the afterlife is not as direct is what it is from the Quran. The Quran tells you that there's a system of things that are going to happen. You're going to live, you're going to die, you're going to stand in front of God, 
then there's heaven and hell. So for those people that believed in heaven, that believed in God, will achieve heaven. And those people that didn't believe in God will achieve hell. And this is eternal. Not 400 years, not for a thousand years. Eternal is forever and ever and ever. So the reality is when looking at these two things, you need to really examine and ask yourself the question, am I getting the type of answers from a cursory reading of the Bible? Or if I look in the Quran, am I getting the answers and the questions to life, the moral fiber that we need to understand? We, 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 need, to, we need to look at these things. So just, just to look at another point, and that's the issue of that's the issue of worship, you know. We spoke briefly that um, our existence on this earth is to remind ourselves that there is a God, you know. And our existence is so temporary that we sometimes forget we think we're living eternally. There's, there's a story quoted by Ghazali. Ghazali says, picture this person in the jungle. He's walking in the jungle and he sees a lion. Suddenly, the lion starts to chase him and wants to attack him. And as he's running, he sees a well. So he says, my only chance of saving myself is to jump into this well. And as he's jumping, he grabs onto the rope, and he hangs onto the rope so that he doesn't reach the bottom. But as he looks down to the bottom, he sees there's a giant serpent at the bottom of the well. So he's now between the lion and the top of the well and the serpent at the bottom of the well. And he's standing there, absolutely hopeless, despondent, and he sees two rats, a black rat and a white rat coming, and they start nibbling on the rope. So the inevitable end is that he is going to fall. But nonetheless, he looks in front of him and he sees a honeycomb. And he thinks to himself, if I stick my finger in this honeycomb, I'm bound to get some honey. And he does exactly that. He sticks his finger in the honeycomb, he looks at it, and he sticks it in his mouth. And in a few seconds, he forgets about the lion, he forgets about the serpent, he forgets about the two rats eating away on his rope. He just thought about that honey. He says that's the brevity of life. You have death chasing you all the time. You have your grave waiting for you at the bottom. You have day and night gnawing away from your rope. Every day they're gnawing, they're gnawing. Your inevitable result is going to be the grave. But we stick our finger in the honey because that's the temporary world that we're living in. We, 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 we're so attracted to the world and its offerings that we sometimes forget our predicament with, in relationship with God and where we should be. You know? so, so for worship for us, you know, is absolutely, or oh, we should rather not be an effort at any result. For those of us that are so used to our five daily prayers, this is how we worship. This is how God wants us to worship. When I ask a Christian, how do you worship, once again, you're going to get varied responses. Do I sit on the bed with my hands cupped, with my hands open, with my nachmal in my, my hand, trying to be about to get drunk? Do I sit next to my bed, kneeling to my bed? Is this the way of Jesus Christ? If Jesus Christ was the moral example for you, then take a leaf out of his book, how did he worship God? Because if I send 10,000 rand to Rudolf, and it comes to his house, and he's not there, and his wife receives it. And a few days later, I wondered to myself, did Rudolf actually receive the 10,000 rand? And, his, and I'm thinking, but you know what? He never had the courtesy to inform me. Maybe he didn't inform me. So he says, uh, I phoned Rudolf and I says, did you receive the 10,000 rand? He says, yes, I did, but I seen a business card, so I thank the business card. I said, but I sent you the money. Why are you thanking the business card? So for us as Muslims, we, we worship God in a ritualized fashion. This is how we believe that God showed us to worship him. When we read in uh, the story of the Chronicles of Jesus Christ, when Jesus Christ was in the Garden of Gethsemane, he fell on his face and he prayed. He washed his disciples' feet. We do the same thing. We wash our feet and then we fall on our faces and we pray. Because this was the message that was brought to us, shown to us by Prophet Muhammad, and this is how he was taught to pray. So till eternity, Muslims will continue to pray in a particular manner and fashion. So much so that I can walk into a church, a mosque in Russia, or in Japan, or in Australia, or in South America, or anywhere, and I can join the prayer because the prayer is the same. We pray in the Arabic language because it gives us a uniformity, and that's the mode that we've been taught. So our ritual worship is then structured, it's organized, it's, it gives us some sort of a grounding and this connection with God in the way that God wants us 
to be connected with him. So for us, that's important. All right, how much time do I have? Okay, all right, good. So what, I, what I'm saying is, I've read the Bible. I'm sure you guys are aware of it. I've read the Bible, and I'm not being wholly subject, uh, subjective. I'm placing things on equal scales, and I'm asking myself, when I look at Christians, do I understand them to be the type of God-fearing people that we see amongst ourselves? For example, Christianity is silent on many issues. Christianity allows alcohol, but how far does that go? If a person is an alcoholic, is it a sin? Then a person may move to a different level of, of alcoholism. He may start taking drugs. How far is, where, what, how does that fall within the ambit of Christianity? Does Christianity have laws and convictions about how to deal with these particular issues? I give you an example, and this is an every, everyday example. Until recently, homosexuality was not allowed within the Christian uh, framework. And we know that, and you know, it was, you could not even pastor if you were homosexual. The churches would not even condone these types of marriages. And the long and short of it is, we've seen it in my own life, I've seen the culture change. I've seen the mentality towards this thing change. I mean, I think it was Jimmy Swagger that condemned it, and he said that if God had to do to us what he did to the people of Lot, we, we, would not, we can't blame God for that because we're in a worse position now in terms of our sexuality and homosexuality than the people of Lot. But God condemned this in the earlier books. We have come and we are continuing to replace and evolve the religions. I look at Christianity and I think to myself, where does it end? Where does it... So, so, so today, homosexuality, it's openly, it's become an open part and parcel of the community. As a Muslim, we don't have that prerogative. What was outlawed and what was regulated 1,400 years ago will continue to be outlawed and, for, and regulated 1,400 years later. We don't have the benefit of choosing what and how. Even if all the religious scholars of Islam came together and they, they decided that alcohol needs to be unbanned, it's impossible because it's legislated and it's perfected within the Quranic system. So we have a religion that is God-given unshakable, we've not been able, nobody's been able to change it in 1400 years, and for us, this is the complete religion, and we voluntarily, wholeheartedly accept Islam as our faith because, because of the bigger picture. Thank you so much, people. Sure. Um, thank you for that. I appreciate the personal character of that testimony, and I think that some even moves me, because that's why I gave the personal one myself. And, uh, you know, it's when I listen to people like Muhammad that there's a strong feeling in me towards Muslim people and towards the fact that you guys stand so strongly for what you know the truth is about God, his existence, his character. And I listen to you talking about homosexuality and things. And it's actually embarrassing to us that it's in the traditional Christian world that's gone over to secularism where all these things are coming up. And in that score, I don't know what to say to you in reply. I can only say that I'm grateful so often for the fact that Muslim people stand their ground on these things all over the world and don't give way. And that's something I appreciate very much. For me, it always comes down to a personal issue. I myself, as a Christian sitting here, I, I don't think I'm much of a Christian. I don't. I think I've done well in much of what I've studied and learned, but as a person, I don't have a good image of myself. I just know myself only too well. And uh, when you start saying, if I look at Christian people in the world today, I don't see much to be impressed with. Well, I also don't. I, I don't see it in myself if I look in the mirror. I'm not impressed with myself. And, but for me, again, it falls back on one thing. I was brought to the point many years ago of giving up on myself as ever being able to become the kind of person that I knew God would ever really want me to be. And that unless I was born of his spirit and becoming a new person, I could never be saved. And it brings me back to the only person that I point people towards and the only person that, as a Christian, that I'm looking at. I don't look for good examples among Christians. We know even from some, I mean, just look at Shepard Bushiri and people like this. I mean, it's embarrassing that these guys, you know, are up on fraud charges of 100 million rand and then they go and duck out of the country and so on. Um, I, I always encourage people to look at Jesus, only Jesus. And it brings me back to what I'd spoken to some of you earlier in the week, which I'm going to respond and comment on what uh, Muhammad brought out 
about the very uh, moment where Jesus went into Jerusalem on the donkey. And I've often seen pictures of, you know, Jesus coming in, sitting on the donkey, donkeys sort of coming into town, all the palm branches in front and the Jewish people hailing him, Hosanna to the son of David, and so on. But as I pointed out earlier in this week, uh, all four gospel writers, as you rightly said, record this, but they also all record the same thing, that Jesus came into Jerusalem sitting on a donkey's coat on the foal. And in fact, Mark, Luke, and John only mention that. John only quotes the scripture uh, from Zechariah 9.9. 9. But Matthew tells you a little bit more detail that Jesus said, go into the city and you'll find an ass tied with her colt. Bring them both. And tell the, anybody asks you, what are you doing? Say to them, the Lord has need of it, and he'll send them back. So what happened was, according to Matthew, that the donkey itself at the front would obviously have been led by somebody, and Jesus sat on the colt behind the donkey. Now, I've never seen that in a picture, but that's what you're being told. He's sitting on the foal of an ass. And that's what Zechariah 9.9 says, Behold, your king comes to you, triumphant and glorious is he. That's the glorious son of David coming in good time. But then he says, humbled and sitting on a donkey. And nochal, as I said to you in Africa, nochal, even on a colt, the phone of, foal of a donkey. And the reason is simply this, because Jesus, when he came into Jerusalem, did not come in purely as a humble prophet wishing to represent his humility in sitting on a donkey. He certainly did not come in sitting on a black horse in triumph with a king's crown on his head. In none of that. What Jesus did was, and Matthew says it, put his garments on the colt and then sat on the colt himself. He came into Jerusalem not sitting on the donkey, sitting on the colt. Anybody who had a donkey and a colt would put the baggage on the colt and sit on the donkey. Come in on the donkey and sit with their baggage on the colt. Jesus became the baggage. He put himself on the colt to symbolize the fact that he wasn't even coming into Jerusalem in humility alone. He was coming to humble himself to the point of being coming the baggage. He knew within a week he was going to be dead. And he wasn't going to resist it. He was giving himself up for us all. And that to me is the, is, is, is the whole representation of that story and of everything else. I don't as a Christian know, and I mean this again, this is just me personally testifying. I cannot believe that anything that I try to do, even it's too late now, I'm 72, I can't reverse my life. But if I had to try and be everything that God wanted me to be, I couldn't do it. Uh, you said that the absolute minimum for a Muslim is to pray five times a day every day. And you, I know, will be one of the first to admit to me very few Muslims do that or could do it. In today's world, I think, especially in the Western world, I mean, you're, you're in the same business as me. It's very difficult to do that. It, it, it's a demand on a person. But I still ask myself the question, and this is where, to me, uh, as you've spoken about weaknesses in Christianity, this is where I see a weakness in Islam. I don't see the point of having to go five times today to mosque only to go through the same thing every day. You go through a rokat, you go through the same procedure, you go through the sajda, and so on. You, you, you give a testimony to the left, where, you give a testimony to the right, and you do that more than once every time you go. And you do it five times a day, every day, and it's been done so for centuries. If it is just done as a discipline, well, then that's all it would be. But prayer, to me, goes way beyond just a discipline. I'm not sure what the purpose is, what purpose it serves to the God of heaven, that we should do the same thing five times a day, and not just five times. You'll do it 10, 15 times the rakat when you go through it. They're repeated and it just depends which time of day it is, which prayer time of the five as to whether you do it. So that, that for me is where Islam to me doesn't, what, whatever it does, one thing it doesn't do is bring this personal issue of sin into focus and the fact that I knew 50 years ago that I stood condemned when I came face to face with the New Testament showing me who God is and showing me who Jesus is, I knew who I was, and I knew that I stand condemned. And that to, would be my impression of myself right down to the present day, to right this very time, if I had to try and start all over again. I'm a Christian because I look at Jesus, and when I just see his love for us, and what he was willing to do the first time he came into the world, means everything to me. 
I'll close by just looking at the contrast between the baptism of Jesus and the transfiguration. On both occasions, uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they all record the story. On both occasions, uh, God speaks from heaven and says, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. So <clears throat> at the baptism, that voice came from heaven and at the transfiguration. And I've learned that when in the scriptures, when in the Bible you find things repeated like that, and you can see them linked, it means the incidents are linked. The baptism and the transfiguration are strongly linked. The same goes you know, for other things in scripture where you see that, like for example, that the birth of John the Baptist, uh, his mother uh, Elizabeth was barren, she'd never had children, and they were too old, Elizabeth and Zechariah, to have children. Now that is a parallel with Isaac and with Sarah and Abraham. And I've seen the contrast of that, that Luke sees it. Luke, being a Gentile, sees that that linkage between the two. He knows, as a Gentile, I have no hope in the Jewish Messiah, unless he comes as the promised son of Abraham to save the whole world for all nations. And when he sees that, he links John the Baptist with Isaac and not with David. And it's the Isaac representing the salvation coming through the sacrifice that uh, comes out in that linkage. But when you go back to the baptism of Jesus, what I see is this. Jesus comes, when Jesus said, thus it is written that the Christ will suffer and then enter his glory. People are being baptized in the Jordan River and I'm saying to myself, why the Jordan River? Secondly, why baptism? Baptism wasn't a sort of Jewish rite, let alone for the forgiveness of sins. In Judaism, a sacrifice of animals was symbolic for the forgiveness of sins. But John the Baptist stands there at this interface between the Jewish and the Gentile world and baptizes people in the river, confessing their sins. And that means that each one goes into the river and allows the water to come over him and virtually buries himself as if to say to God, I'm dead in my trespasses and sins, and symbolically I'd love to wash them off in this river and come up in the hope that they will be forgiven. When Jesus goes into the water and he goes, he offers himself for that redemption. And he's saying to his Father in heaven, I'm offering myself, the sinless one, for all the sins of the people who are here and elsewhere. And when he comes up, then of course the heaven bursts open. But I want you to notice just how Jesus... It was all very quick. It just went into the water. Water closes over him. And then he comes up the other side. And God anoints him with the Holy Spirit and speaks from heaven. What I see here is something very unusual. In Old Testament times, when the people of Israel came into the Promised Land, they stood on the edge of the Jordan River. And on that occasion, when the priests put the Ark of the Covenant, where the presence of God was, the waters opened. They opened up and banked up. And Joshua says... You know, it was, it was flood time anyway. The waters were pouring down and the people of Israel were able to go through. Many years later, when the Son of God himself comes down, he comes from the other side, he comes from the west, Israel itself, comes to the Jordan River. And when he goes into the water, you would think, now they're really going to open. You know, this is God's own son here. If you open for the Israelites, what about him? But the opposite happens. The waters close over him. But when he comes up out of the water, the heavens open and God speaks and the Holy Spirit comes down as a dove. And I see the symbolism of that, that there's no hope for the people going into the water, but only if the heavens open and the saving grace of God comes. How, many, how much time? Time. Time. Just a, just a closing with one second. The transfiguration was going up the mountain to the top and being transfigured in glory, in the glory of God himself, manifest in him like no other human being has ever had, and then coming down again. And that's the hope of every one of us. Like Peter, James, and John, we may be there with him when it comes. Thank you. Thanks, Mom. So, yeah, just to uh, touch on some of the previous issues, I think um, John mentioned the fact that the Quran used the word Messiah for Jesus, and I... It needs some elaboration. You see, the Christian understanding of the Messiah, which is the translation of the Greek word Christos, Christ, is that the Jews has an, had an expectation that the Messiah will come and fulfill certain previous prophecies. And that specifically included the liber liberation of the Jews from their oppressors. And that never materialized. So that's why Jews never saw Jesus Christ 
as the Messiah because he was unable to fulfill the most important of his functions, roles, and responsibilities. But nonetheless, J Jesus went on to preach and to minister to various people, but as if it was a division of Judaism. Jesus' ministry was the div division of Judaism. Had it not been for the Gentiles to then embrace Christianity, it would not have been a separate religion on its own. Christianity would not have existed today except that it would have been a form of Judaism in the early years. But from a Muslim perspective, what does Messiah mean? How is the Quran referencing the word Messiah or Messiah? How we look at it is a bit different. We see Messiah is the translation being anointed. Anointed could mean a few things. More particularly, it means that you have been appointed to fulfill a particular purpose. And it doesn't necessarily, in our case, when Jesus was appointed, it was not to liberate the children of Israel. But rather, appoint, appointment was an anointment where in the earlier years they would take oil and they would brush it over your head, olive oil more particularly, and that was the cu custom and that was how the name and the title of appointed or anointed or messiah then actually came into place. So a king would have been anointed by the oil. So we see the concept and the word being used totally separate to what, how the Christians would use the word Messiah. And from our understanding is the rejection of Jesus Christ was there because they expected certain things from him and he was unable to fulfill, they rejected him. But we don't reject Jesus Christ. As mentioned previously, our respect for Jesus Christ transcends all. You don't need to convince me, you don't need to hold a gun to my head for me to, for me to accept that Jesus was born miraculously. And there is no other faith other than Islam and Christianity where they will wholeheartedly accept that Jesus was born of a miraculous birth. It's impossible for you to understand. Imagine if my sister comes home and she says, I'm pregnant, but it was a miraculous birth. I mean, common sense tells you to think otherwise. You know, it may be an excuse for her, but the reality of the situation, it doesn't exist. For us to accept something that happened 2,000 years ago may at first appear to be absurd. If you're going to then just read a book that says uh, Jesus was born of a miraculous birth, but for us the Quran has a different meaning and an understanding. Whatever happens in the Quran, we accept it wholeheartedly. I don't need for a Christian to convince me of the miracles of Jesus Christ that was done by God's permission. We also believe in the various uh, miracles of Jesus Christ, and I must add with God's permission, because for us, like Noah, who built the sea and the floods and he survived, that's what happened with the permission of God. Like Moses, who separated the seas and for his people to be saved, was the miracle that was attributed to, to Moses, but with the permission of God. Jesus was able to do many things. He was able to resurrect the dead with God's permission. He was able to, to know the inner workings and the mechanisms of a person without a person telling him, and, and some of which is recorded in the Bible, and we ourselves have different understandings and miracles of Jesus Christ. And one of the miracles of Jesus Christ is that he was not killed, he was resurrected, he was saved by God. And this is, I suppose, where we would part ways. He was saved by God and he was raised up to God and he will return. So a Muslim would agree with you that Jesus will return. But if we look at it from a Christian perspective and we read New Testament writings, the writers tell you that Jesus Christ informed the people that he will return in their time. This is how the disciples understood it. We obviously have a different understanding of it. We believe Jesus Christ will come at the end of times, which Christians believe, but we don't know when and we cannot say. All we know is that it's the sign of the final hour. When Jesus Christ comes, we also believe in, a, in the Messiah, the, the Antichrist. He will also come at the end of time and certain world events are going to be happening so th these things will unfold because it's, it's uh, an ecology of the end of times and where we need to be. So just putting things in perspective from there, we do have a separation in terms of where we need to be. Regarding the prayer in itself, I'm aware that certain, uh, that Judaism also had inculcated the prayer. They used to pray three times a day. So there are some Jews still today that established the prayer, and we understand that this was a God-given gift to these people at that, that particular time. And if I try to begin to explain the nature of prayer and the value it is to us, it's like me trying to explain the color yellow to you. It's virtually impossible. But people that embrace the faith 
and get acquainted with it after a few months when we ask them from a personal, how's it going, are you managing to pray, they fall deeply in love with the prayer. And, and, and you should try to speak to, the, 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 to ex-Christians that have reverted and are now Muslims, what's their perspective of things. They feel that this was something that was lacking. The structure that we have about the prayer is what attracted them to Islam in the first place. Funny enough, as much as some people may view it as being uh, cumbersome or a chore, the people that embrace Islam and actually get involved with the prayer is something they involve themselves with to the extent that they love it. And why did John quite rightly says there are many Muslims that don't pray? More particularly, it's people that don't appreciate their religion like they should. And could, in many instances, these are born Muslims that just, it was as if they're born Muslims and they're Muslims by name, and some of the rituals they will take part in, in some of the rituals, are just seem to be too cumbersome. Those, I mean, are, are really, uh, of course, every religion has that. So we sit with this problem as well. But people that honestly change their religion and embrace Islam, you'll find within themselves there actually is a love for this type of thing. So we view it a bit differently to, to, to how Christians would view it. Where, where are we in terms of time there? Okay, so, um, so, so, so what, what happens is that in our day-to-day -day life, Islam regulates us, and you know, I, I just want to touch on this point because I'll probably be, I have the last few minutes and I won't say anything more. But Islam is more than that. Islam regulates for us for example, personal hygiene, relationship with people, just, just on the issue, and, and, I, and I'm going to say this just so people can understand, right down to shaving underneath your armpits is something that Islam regulates for us. You've you got to do it. It's part of your, 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 your natural inclination, your natural body functions that you need to do these particular things. So we are regulated in terms of shaving pubic hairs, shaving hair, your hair underneath your arms, bathing regularly, having a, a good sense of, of hygiene. Remember you're talking to, 1400 years ago, you're talking to a Bedouin Arabs as well, where water was a difficulty. They had to find ways to meet these requirements. They had to find ways to keep themselves hygienic and clean. Even right down to going to the, using the toilet, for us, there's a ritual associated with it. And I'll tell you, you know, the reality is when we go to the toilet, we're encouraged to use water if we use the toilet paper and the water, it's the best situation. Why? Because this is part of personal hygiene. I know from personal experience, when you're trying to clean a baby's diaper, using toilet paper or using wet wipes has different results. If you're trying, for example, and, and I'm talking really just, just in an effort to give you an example. I have some Muslims that actually left Islam. When you speak to them, so did you abandon your toilet habit as well? They tell you we can't. For us, it's part of good moral hygiene. So Islam dictates our lives in so many ways. Going to the bathroom, every relationship with our wife, praying, business dealings. It's an all-encompassing religion that, um, that we submit to. But thank you so much. I appreciate the time, the 10 minutes. Uh, sorry, I've got some books here. So you feel free to pick up my books on your way out also. You've got two minutes to say something about your book. Okay. Just... Yeah, that will be a good opportunity. <laughs> so what I've done is... Um, a few years ago, as part of my ministering to Christians, I found that um, there's a lot of questions and sometimes you have maybe five or ten minutes um, discussion with a person. You may meet him in the supermarket or in a parking lot or something and he wants to know a few words. So what I did is I decided to compile a booklet. I haven't made it too big because I know people don't read. That's a big problem today. If you send a WhatsApp message, it's more than five lines long. <laughs> If you send a WhatsApp message more than five lines and you ask the guy what's on the sixth line, he won't know. So I've tried to make it as succinct as possible. Um, it's, it's, it's good for you. I've, I've actually used this now more as a replacement of spending too much time. I, I'll email them or WhatsApp them a book or I'll give them a physical copy and I'll tell them to contact me a few days later just to make sure that they've read it and they've understood it. And it saved me also a lot of effort. Uh, yeah, so have a, have a look at it. It just gives you an understanding for us what is the priority. I mean, obviously, Islam is, uh, like I said, mentioned earlier, it's, it's a huge topic. It's, 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 we can go on and on and on for years discussing Islam. But when I meet a Muslim, I just need to explain to him the fundamentals of our religion. And looking at the contents briefly is to believe in God Almighty. That for us is most important, the, the, the theism of the whole thing. What is the Quran? How the Quran plays a role in our life? The Prophet Muhammad, who he was, um, the companions of the Prophet, like Jesus had disciples, Prophet Muhammad also had disciples that assisted him in his mission. Um, 
the creation and the angels, so where we fit in, the devil, heaven and hell, previous prophets, our life on earth, Islam is the obvious choice. So yeah, so it's just a brief summary. It can't take you longer than an hour to read this. I, I do have more books, so if you run out of books, just ask me for a few more. Thanks, guys. You're welcome. <laughs>